complex environment. When we talk about complex environment, we can think about biological systems such as protein, phospholipid bilayer, but also we can think about mixture of liquids, liquids with salts, with counter-ions in a lot of things. So then I'm going to present a little bit uh, the methodology that we use, some implementations that we did in our group. We apply several methods, but also we develop programs and we develop procedures how to treat this kind of systems. And I'm going to show some results and some example. Then you can see how good our modeling are. <laughs> Uh, so, in our group, we start studying in general uh, systems, molecules in liquid system. We can model in water and any kind of solvent. Also, we can treat the molecule in solution, but in contact with a metallic or a solid surface, or a surface that has some pores, and then the system can migrate to the pores or also some system with biological motivation, such as phospholipid bilayers, where we can study, for example, drugs, how one specific drug can interact with the membrane of the cell, and also molecules that interact with protein. In general, we are looking for a specific target for some disease, and we wanted to study and to see if the regular methods that people work, if they are doing well done or not, how to improve this methodology and so on. So, uh, we use methods that put together quantum mechanics and also molecular mechanics. I'm going to talk a little bit about that because when we talk about molecular mechanics, we mimic the interactions that can be calculated by quantum mechanics in classical equations. So then all the molecules, they are not going to interact with first principle equation, Schrodinger equation, for example, but they are going to interact by a classical force field, one empirical equation full of parameters. And the idea is how to put together these two methodologies, this hybrid method, in the sense that we can avoid a very large computational cost and can treat it. So then, if we use these both methodologies together, we can calculate thermodynamic properties, structural properties, like free energy difference, reactive process, and PKA, or geometry changes, orientation. Also, we can calculate electronic properties. And with this, we can calculate almost all the spectroscopy, and we can compare that with experimental data, like UV visible electronic absorption spectrum when you excite the electron or when the electron when the electron come back the fluorescence or the phosphorescence spectra the emission spectra also when the molecule interact with the magnetic field and then you have the uh, nuclear resonance magnetic and you have also uh, spectroscopy in the infrared. You can see the vibrational motion of the molecules. You can also excite the core electron. That's the X-ray photoelectric spectroscopy. So we can deal with a lot of spectroscopy that are used to characterize a system. And we can see if our system is well characterized. And once we can reproduce the experimental data, we can understand, try to understand why this molecule is giving this answer, how the environment affects the property, and how I can improve or change the molecule to make a better molecule for a specific device or a specific technological application, okay? So then the idea here is try to understand the molecule and try to propose new molecules that can improve the property desired. So when we do that, we use what we call hybrid method, QM-MM. QM is quantum mechanic, MM is molecular mechanic. And we use one procedure that we, uh, we systematize in our group that has two steps. The first step, we perform the classical molecular mechanic simulation with the molecule in the environment that we wish to study. Then, after having the, all the positions, because in this simulation, 
In general, we are going to use the molecular dynamic method that I'm going to talk about. We have several snapshots of the coordinates of the molecules. So these molecules are interacting and evolving on time. So we have the trajectories. And if we perform the average over the trajectories, we are going to have the properties. The idea is that once you have the trajectory, we can make a statistical analysis, understand how long the system should wait to lose the memory, and then have new statistical information. And also, we can see the structure of the environment around the molecule. And then we can define the first salvation shell, second, and so forth. And we can decide, based on all this statistical information, how many configurations we can calculate the electronic property that we desire. So then, in the sense that we have a much smaller system based on the distribution of the solvent around the solute, and also from the simulation in general, we, we calculate or we generate around millions of configurations that are accessible in the thermodynamic conditions. But we cannot perform millions of quantum mechanical calculations. So then we use this to reduce the number of configurations that we should use in the quantum mechanical. So then, thinking about that, we go to the quantum mechanics. If we remember the Schrodinger equation, we have the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. On T means the time, and R means the coordinate of all the nucleons and the electrons in the molecule. Age is the Hamiltonian, where you have the kinetic energy of the nucleons, kinetic energy of the electrons, interaction between nucleon and nucleon, nucleon electrons, and electrons and electrons. But if we wanted to study stationary states, we can write the Schrodinger equation in a non-dependent form, in an independent on time. And basically, the first approximation that we use to solve the Schrodinger equation is the Boppenheim approximation. With this approximation, we are going to uncouple the movement of the nucleus and the electrons because we know that they have a different time scale and a different energy scale. And then once we decouple that, we are going to consider a fixed position, a fixed configuration where all the nucleus are fixed. And once we have that, we rewrite the electronic Schrodinger equation only with the coordinates of the electrons. We are going to obtain the wave function, we have the Hamiltonian, and we are going to have the energy of the states, but this energy depends parametrically from the position of the nucleons, because to define the wave function, you needed to know the positions of the nucleons, and if you change this position, you are going to have a diff different wave function and also different set of energies, okay? So once you have that, we can think about the concept of potential energy surface. Is the surface where I'm changing the position of the nucleons and I'm seeing the total energy of the system. I can identify regions that has minimum of energy. In other words, this position will be more probable to occur or we can find maximums where the, the system will be not be there very often. So then thinking about the, this surface energy, we know that now we are going to generate the motion of the atoms with the classical mechanics. And then once we have the position of the atom in a specific configuration, we are going to solve the Schrodinger equation and have the wave function. So that's in the sense that we put together the two methodologies, the quantum and the classical, okay? So then to solve the movement of the atoms, we are going to use the classical molecular mechanics. And we are going to use the Newton's equations of law to calculate the motion. The idea is that we are going to have an initial configuration where we put the initial positions, initial velocities. And with the positions of the atoms defined, we can have expression where we can calculate the potential energy. So if we have the gradient of the potential energy, we are going to calculate the force 
on that time in, in each atom of the system. Having the four total force, we can calculate the acceleration dividing the force by the mass. So once we have the velocity, position, and acceleration, we can integrate on time and have new positions and new velocities. So with this kind of methodology, we are going to spend a very small delta t because in this approximation, we are truncating here the Taylor expansion. So then we should have a very small delta t to have a good validation of this algorithm. And then evolving this delta t, we are going to have new positions, new velocities where we can calculate new accelerations and go on. So then we can generate a trajectory. In general, when we perform that kind of uh, classical mechanics simulation, we are going to use delta t that in, in scale of femtosecond. It means that we are going to look each delta t in 10 to minus 15 seconds. So that's why we have a lot of uh, restriction on how long we can perform our simulation. So if you go to the state of art in the literature, you can find simulations with few microseconds, mean 10 and minus 6. It means that you are going to need to solve these equations of motions for around 500,000 or 1 million atoms, 1 million times or 10 million times or 100 million times. So then you can see that we need a lot of computation even using a very simple equation, the classical equation of motion. If you wanted to describe, for example, a phospholipid bilayer, we are considering systems that we have only eight lipids for eight lipids. So this is in real nano scale, okay? We cannot, okay, we, we here at USP, we cannot simulate the entire cell or entire virus, but if you go to the United States or Europe, Europe, Europe and use these very big supercomputers, there are some people that can simulate that, but for a very small computational time, okay? Here we still with system that has reasonable size, around 500,000 uh, atoms or 1 million atoms, not larger than this, but if you really want to have large system, then you need to go on on the methodology and now using what we call coarse grain simulation is that instead of consider all the atoms of the system, we are going to consider as a small sphere, a bunch of atoms, okay? Then we are not going to see the atomic detail anymore and we cannot calculate quantum mechanical calculation anymore because the molecule will be not described by the atoms, but the blocks of atoms, okay? So, but going back, in our system, we are going to describe the atomistic interactions with this force field here, and we are going to perform the molecular dynamic simulation to have the trajectories. Then we perform statistical analysis, make quantum mechanical calculations, and we obtain the property that we are interested. So, but then when we think about this kind of methodology in two steps methodology, what we have is that the classical potential should be set up before performing the quantum calculation. So, in the sense that we have no information of the in electronic interaction of the environment in the molecule before performing the simulation. So that it means that we have two methods that are uncoupled one with the other, okay? And the idea is to make the electronic property of the molecule response to the environment and make this together. And then to put together these two things, we propose one method that we call the iterative polarization procedure, where we are going to start our simulations and in the force field, we should have a charge distribution of the molecule, okay? So to have the charge distribution means that in the first beginning, we needed to perform a quantum mechanical calculation and discover how the charge are distributed in the atoms of the molecules. Once we know that, in general, this calculation is performed in the, in the vacuum, in the isolated molecule, 
we have this set of charges. And then we perform the simulation. We identify the solvent surrounding the molecule. And now we perform a new quantum mechanical calculation with this electrostatic embedding of the all molecules surrounding and see how the charges here in the molecule distribute. When you, you do that, the dipole moment that you have before in the zero approximation in vacuum, with the other molecules around, you are going to increase this dipole moment and generate a new set of charges. Then you use this new set of charges and perform a new simulation again. So we are going to perform an iterative method until we reach the equilibrium of the charge distribution of the molecule and the molecules surrounding this molecule, okay? Because the positions of the molecules will depend on the charge. And the charge will depend on the positions of the molecules. That's why we propose this kind of iterative method. And we can show that in the end, we can reach a converged uh, distribution of charge. And in this sense, now we are going to have a coupling procedure that we make simulations, quantum mechanics, simulations, quantum mechanics, until we reach the equilibrium. And then we make only the simulation to have the information of the structure, okay? So here, I'm showing an example how this molecule called a benzophenone, we have two aromatic rings here, and here we have a C double O, a carbon and oxygen. And we know that this molecule in water are going to form hydrogen bonds in this, in this part here. And this is the distribution, how the water molecules distribute around this molecule. And the first peak, peak characterizes the number of the hydrogen bonds that we are going to have. And then if we start the charges of the molecule in the vacuum, we are going to have 1.3 hydrogen bonds in average. When we look to 10,000 configurations, we make an average, we have around that. But once we take this structure here, calculate the new charges and get a higher dipole moment, you can see that the next time this first peak becomes sharper and higher, meaning that you are increasing the number of hydrogen bonds. And when you do that several times, you are going to increase the number of hydrogen bonds until around 2.3 2 hydrogen bonds, meaning that you almost duplicate the number of molecules that are closely interacting with this molecule. And also, we can analyze the first salvation shell, the second, and so on. In this case, additionally, we analyze, for example, how is the binding energy of this molecule that performs the hydrogen bond, and in the beginning is 4.2 kcal per mole. In the end, we have 7.3 kcal per mole, meaning that this hydrogen bond is much stronger caused by the polarization that the environment performed on the molecule. So knowing that the environment can change this charge distribution, we look for several properties. For example, we want also now to calculate the absorption spectrum. This is the uh, uh, illustration of the ground state uh, curve, where here in the minimum you have the best geometry of the molecule. If the molecule change for other geometry, you are going to change on this way. And this is the energy of the excited state. So in the absorption spectrum measured experimentally, you are going to calculate the energy of the photon that is absorbed by the molecule, okay? So when we put this molecule here in an environment, it means that either the ground state and either the excited state, both, are going to interact with the solvent, but in different sense, because they have different electronic structure. So one can stabilize better than the other. And when we have that, we can have experimentally talking different positions of the absorption spectrum is what I'm showing here, for example, for this molecule here. This is the absorption band in yellow when we have chloroform, and this absorption is almost around uh, 663, uh, oh, 630 wavelength here. But when we change it to methanol, to dichloromethane or water, 
we can see clearly the band shifting from one solvent to the other. And in this region, we are in the visible region, okay? If we absorb a light, we are going to see the complementary color. That's why we are going to see all this color when we, make, uh, when we measure the absorption spectrum of this molecule in different solvents. So then we can use this kind of methodology as a probe of the environment, okay? You can do a lot of technological devices. For example, you can make a, a set that the person can go to a river, take a water, put in different solvents, and analyze if there is a specific polluent, for example, because this polluent can change color in different solvents. So then this is a very interesting uh, device because color is one of the things that we humans, we can identify very easily. So it's a very simple dispositive to see different colors, okay? So, but then we can, we need to understand what the, the environment are doing with this molecule to make it all this large change, okay? So then that's why all these molecules we call dye or probes, because we know that they are very sensitive to the environment. But we have other kinds of molecules that when we change the environment, the absorption spectrum is almost the same. It meaning that this molecule, the electronic structure, is very rigid and is feeling nothing about the interaction with the environment. So in this kind of molecule, the electronic structure should be very soft and vulnerable to any change on the environment, but this kind of molecule, no. And this is the kind of the behavior that we have on drugs, okay? And it, it's, it's simple to understand that because in most of us, we have different chemical environments. If we eat a lot of salt, if we eat a lot of uh, uh, fat, or if you eat sugar, our in chemical environment surrounding many parts of our organism should have different concentrations of salts or lipids or other things. And if the drug is too sensitive to this environment, probably will be an, a different function in the body of one person and the body of the other person. So that's why most of the biological molecule, unless the molecule has a very specific a function in the organism, but most of them, they are very robust. They do not care if you eat much salt than me, and they work the same, okay? So then, when we are going to the lab to study probes that we made to do experiments because we wanted to see different environments is one thing. But when you go to the biological environment, then it's sometimes much simple because the molecules are not so complicated than the probes, okay? So, and when we think about that, the problem that we had a few years ago was this one. In the phospholipid bilayer, we have one part of the molecule that we call the polar head. This polar part of the molecule likes to interact with the other, with the water. But we have also chains of carbons that are very unpolar, and they do not like to interact with the water. That's why when you put all these phospholipids in water, they form these bilayers, okay? All the heads are up, all the heads are down, and all the tails are here in the middle. But we can see when you take a look in the structure of these lipids that there are typically two phases. One that we call gel phase, where the heads and the tails, they are almost organized. But also we have the fluid phase where they, they are very this unorganized. And you can measure this phase transition in the lab doing the calorimetry uh, uh, measurements. And one thing that is easy to see is a fluorescent probe because when you put a fluorescent probe and you excite the molecule on that wavelength, even with a very, very, very small concentration of the molecule, you can see the fluorescence of the material. So then, for see if the membrane is in a gel phase or in the fluid phase, 
In general, they use molecules like this molecule here that called the probe of phospholipid bilayers because the fluorescence of the probe is in 440 if the, the membrane is in the gel phase, but the fluorescence is in the 510 if it is in, in, in fluid phase. So you put the probe, measure the fluorescence. If you see different fluorescence, you can infer that the membrane is in one phase or in the other phase. And you can put, for example, several drugs and repeat the experiment and to see if the drugs has some rule to enrich it the membrane or to make the membrane softer or to disrupt the membrane, a lot of effect that the drug can have in the, in the membrane. So, and then you can see here in this phospholipid here, it's called DPPG. Two letter classify the head and two letter classify the tail. And in this, this phospholipid here, the transition phase is in 41 degrees. So this is the lipid most common in our cell. And this is one of the reasons that we cannot reach fever higher than 41 degrees. Because once you have that, all your membranes started to change phase. And then it starts a very dramatic change in your body, okay? So then, but for our lucky, our membranes do not only have this kind of lipids, but is, they are mixture with others. But the majority are these lipids here. So then, if we know that the phase transition is 41, we can see these curves here. See, this is 30, this is 40, and the, maxim, the fluorescence is here. But then when we change it to 50, 60, 70, the fluorescence is here. So everything is okay. But then in the lab close to my office, they do experiments with membranes. They try another phospholipid. It calls DLPC. The, in this case, the transition phase is in zero degrees Celsius. But when you take a look in the difference on temperature, how the fluorescence change, you can see the same change around 20, 30 degrees, but there is no phase transition. And the question was, why this molecule is behaving like that? Because we thought that the, the change of the environment will occur only when we have phase transition. But something is different here. So then we start a project to try to understand the behavior of this molecule here in this kind of lipid here to understand what was going on. And the first initial thing was to try to understand how the dipole moment of the molecule change in different environments doing this polarization procedure that I explained. And as you can see, the molecule has a dipole in vacuum around 5.8, but when we increase the, polar, uh, the polarity of the environment, going to cyclohexane, acetonitrile, and water, you can almost duplicate the size of the dipole moment, meaning that you have a very strong charge delocalization and change on this, on this kind of molecule, okay? And then our question was, okay, if the, this molecule has all this change, when you have a uniform environment, what about the membrane? Because the membrane, you have the water, that is very polar, then you have, you have the, the heads that half polar, and then you have the tails that are completely unpolar. So how the molecule will behave when find some heterogeneous interactions? And then we started to perform simulations. Here are the setups that we have. We have almost only four, uh, 340 lipids, meaning that we have less than 200 lipids in one part and 200 lipids in the, the other. For each lipid, we have an average of 50 water molecule. We have, for example, around 80,000 water molecule. We establish the temperature, the time step that we are going to solve the, the classical Newton equations, and a lot of parameters. And once we have that, 
we start our simulation with a very ordered uh, structure where we put the lipids here, they are on green light color, and all the water molecules here, they are dark. And we spend around 100 nanoseconds to see the system in equilibrium. Once we have the equilibrium, we can compare with a lot of experimental data, like, for example, the width of the membrane, the area per lipid. We had some experimental data that we can evaluate if our classical uh, mapping of the interactions, they are correct or not. Once we have that, we can take a look in different groups of the molecule. We can put the molecule of our interest in different initial positions and analyze where are going to be the position of the molecule, okay, in the end of the simulation. In the case of this molecule, the prodan that we studied before, we saw that for it can have different electronic distribution depending on the environment. And then our idea was to understand if we consider the non-polarizable charges, meaning the vacuum charges, the cyclohexane charges or the water charges, all for the ground state or the water charges for the excited state, is this molecule is going to be in the same location of the phospholipid membrane? And we perform all these simulations and we take a look here is the distribution of the phospholipid membrane. This is exactly the, the middle of the membrane, and this is the head group of the membrane. This black one is the distribution of the atoms of the phospholipids. This yellow one is the distribution of water, and this is the total one, okay? So we know that this part here is in the interface between the phospholipid bay layer and the water. And we take a look at the distribution of the molecule with different charge sets. And what was surprising for us that depending on the charge that you put it, the molecule located in different position of the molecule, meaning that the location depend on the set of charges that you select to start the simulation. And in this case here, when we performed the non-polarizable charges, the molecule was completely surrounded by the carbon tails of the molecule. In this case here that we have a polarizable charges, the molecule was in the interface between the head and the water, interacting with water. So, and then this kind of analysis was very interesting because most of the people that simulated drugs or assimilate any system that are interacting with the molecule, they set up an initial set and perform the simulation and make, make conclusions. And in this case, we show that the conclusion, that is the position of the molecule in the phospholipid, depend on your initial set. And the question now is how to calculate that set of charges because the position depends on the set, and the set depends on the positions. So, again, you have a very complex problem. And we make some theoretical experiments to see how long this is the time evolution of the simulation. And now we track, we, this is zero, is the middle of the membrane. These two lines here represent the interface between the bilayer and the water. So here we have water, the bilayer, and the water. And we take a look on the oxygen and nitrogen of the molecule. When we put the charges of the non-polar molecule, you can see these green and red colors. And I put a arrow and you can see the orientation of the molecule. You can have the oxygen pointing the middle of the, the phospholipid. You can have the molecule rotating parallel to the interface and deep down pointing up. So the molecule is in the middle of the tails, but is completely free to rotate to one side to the other side. And suddenly, I change the charges 
to the set of charges of the polarizable charges in water to see what's going to happen with the molecule. And then you can see that slowly the molecule is going to reach the interface and never is going to rotate it again. Only have the oxygen part facing the uh, water region. Okay? And then with this kind of analysis, we understand that the motion of the molecule inside the phospholipid membrane is very slow. It takes around 10 nanoseconds to make the molecule move from one region to the other region. But the time step to polarize is almost instantaneous. So now we have a problem to different scales because we do not know the position, and if we don't know the position, we don't know the set of charges. So it means that for a study this kind of molecule that has a very soft uh, electronic distribution, we need to plan a new methodology that will uh, make us infer the two processes that is very slow in the position, but very fast in the electronic equilibrium. So then this is an open, open work that now we are trying to calculate free energy changes to understand how is the best, uh, the lowest free energy if the molecule is here in the middle, non-polarized, or here in the interface, polarized one. So as you can see, you can have a lot of very complex behavior of one molecule when you put this molecule in a complex environment, okay? So another molecule that we study was that one that I showed in the beginning, the emodine. It was a drug, and in this case, we saw before that if we change the environment, nothing changed with the absorption spectrum of this molecule. But if we change the pH, it means that I'm putting acid or bases on the simulation, I can see changes on the spectrum of the molecule. So what we have in the reality is that when we put this molecule in a very alkaline uh, environment, this oxygen is gone, okay? We have a reaction and a loss of the hydrogen. And then that's why we have this change of behavior. And the idea was to understand when we add acid or bases in a solution, are you going to have the same concentration close to the phospholipid membrane or a different one depending how far you are from the membrane? And then the experimentalists, they made a, a measurements of the absorption spectrum comparing how the uh, absorption in the phospholipid membrane compare with liquids. And this is the, the measure, the solid line in the phospholipid membrane at the pH 10, and this is in water at pH 10, and you can see that they are very similar. And when you compare with water at pH 6, you have this in the membrane, and this is the molecule in water. So then you can see that they are different. But then when we compare this with another environment, such as chloroform, for example, you can see that we have a good agreement between the chloroform and the phospholipid membrane, and in this case, the phospholipid membrane and ethanol. So meaning that when you change the pH, in fact, the molecule are feeling a different environment and losing this proton or receive this proton depending how close this molecule is to the phospholipid membrane. So then we made some simulations. We identify where this molecule, for example, the emodine is in this position blue here, and all these colors are different groups of the phospholipid bilayers. This is the water region in the green. This red one is the lipid region. And here we can see different groups. So taking a look on what is the group of the phospholipid membrane, the same position of the molecule, we can identify that this, the position, exactly position of this molecule 
and how it was protected of the interaction of water and how it was protected by interaction with acid, hydrogen plus, or alkaline and oxygen H minus, okay? So then with this kind of simulation, we can understand how many, for example, lipids are in the closed first solvation shell of the either the neutral molecule or the deprotonated molecule. You can see that both situations you have around four or five lipids in the surrounding. But when we take a look in the amount of water that the neutral molecule has is around 20, 25. But when we have the protonated molecule, this molecule is much more exposed to the water, having around 40 water molecules interacting, okay? So it means that when we know that the molecule has no ability to polarize itself depending on the environment, it's much easier to study to understand how it interacts with the complex environment and how you get the interaction or best position or the influence of the environment on the molecule. So additionally, we take structures of the phospholipid here. I took off the carbon chain, only that you can see where the molecule is located. This is in the gray color, the, the head groups of the phospholipids, and the blue color, this is the water. And we calculate the absorption spectrum of these molecules and compare with the experimental data is this blue line here. And all these vertical lines, the black one meaning that is the first excitation, the second one, the excitation for the second excited state, excitation for the third excited state, and so on. So putting together all the excitations from different uh, excited states, we can see that we have a very good agreement between the uh, uh, quantum mechanical calculations, selecting the environment around the molecule, and also the absorption spectrum. This for the pH 6, and this is for the pH 10. And this is a, a, very good, a very good description because after having the simulation, we put all the configurations in the quantum mechanical calculations and calculate the absorption spectrum. And we can see that we have a very good description of the molecule and the surrounding around the molecule, okay? So another application that we performed was studying uh, peptides in the behavior close to the phospholipid membranes. And the idea was this peptide here, it uh, has a antibacterial activity. And we studied this peptide interacting with a lipid that is close to the Lipid, uh, lipid, human lipid, uh, human mem uh, lipids of the membranes. This is uh, the model of the lipid of the human membranes, and this other lipid here is the model of the bacterial uh, membranes. Okay, in this case, that the human membranes, the lipids, they are usually neutral molecules. Okay, no charges. But the membranes, in general, they are negatively charged molecules. That's why most of the peptides that have some antibacterial activity, they are positively charged, meaning that they are going to have a very strong interaction with the membrane of the molecule. Sometimes they are going to disrupt the, the bacteria and work in this uh, way, this structure in the membrane, okay? And we have several experiments here. One of them is the uh, circular dichroism spectrum, where you can have one specific spectrum if the peptide is in the alpha helix structure, is this uh, red curve here. But you can have also this other spectrum, this black one, if the, the peptide is completely random conformation. So when you increase the amount of phospholipid on the solution that has this charge, this POPG, you can see that the peptide was initially random, 
and putting more lipids, the peptide started to be helix. And once it become helix, it can interact one peptide with the other, uh, cause aggregation, and with this aggregation, they are going to have a very strong effect on the membrane. So in that kind of analysis, we performed looking to the simulation. So this is the end, end picture of the simulation. We start here with uh, five peptides, and after 200 nanoseconds, we still with very structured membrane, but when we put the membrane charged one, you have a completely disrupted membrane, meaning that we could see the disruption of the membrane looking and putting in the simulation the interaction. This is also an image obtained experimentally by the optical microscopy, okay, where you can see a vesicle formed by the lipid, and this vesicle is intact once you put the, the peptide. And then you are doing the evolution on time, and you can see that you started to have some hole, holes here in the, in the membrane, and after that, the membrane disappear completely, meaning that this peptide is able to disrupt and uh, break the membrane of the bacteria, okay? So, performing that, we make the simulations, we know the compositions of this peptide. This peptide is an hybrid peptide. We have a lot of information about the peptide. And after that, we make our simulation putting here many peptides, and this is the membrane neutral one that mimics our membrane, and this is the charged one that mimics the bacterial one. As you can see, we can have also see the distributions, and we can see that suddenly all the peptides collapse, make a large cluster, and then it starts to disrupt the membrane. Okay? This also we can see, this is how we start the simulations with the peptides in one side after some times, and then if you take a look here, all the peptides, they are aggregated and put it together. All this blue part here, these are salt in the simulation, and then they put together, and is this, this kind of interaction that make the disruption of the, of the membrane, okay? So this is another way to see how the simulation evolves, and in the end, we do not have any kind of bilayer structure caused by the peptide. So, these are uh, the results. This is our group in Sao Paulo, and uh, we have many conclusions of different works, and we can show that uh, we can use this kind of hybrid methods to understand the electronic change of the, the electronic properties of a molecule changed by the environment. And depending on the complexity of the environment and depending on the complexity of the molecule, we can have a lot of combining effect that will cause all these differences that I showed today. Okay? So then, thank you very much for the attention. Thank you, Professor. <laughs> so we have some time for questions. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, I have several questions, if you don't mind. I, it was very interesting. Uh, first of all, you said uh, you use the trajectory and the memory for uh, the, the system has throughout the simulation to estimate the parameters uh, you are interested in. Uh, is it done uh, via green Kubo functions, or is it... Uh, another method of correlation. Uh... We, ca we calculate the autocorrelation function. Okay. And in this case, we can use several different properties. We started with the total energy of the potential energy of the system. Mm -hmm. So if you take a look how the potential energy of the system uh, correlates on time, in general, it has exponential decay. 
and not to one, in general two or three. You can have characterization of different time interactions, and then you can estimate how far you should go in the exponential decay to have a round of 10% of correlation. Okay. And then if you use that and take a look, we have a paper where we calculate 10,000 successive structures. Mm -hmm. We calculate this correlation time, and then we calculate only 100 structures that were separated. And we start with different set, for example, the first one, or we select by random and select all in the interval, and we show that we have the same average properties. Because once you consider correlated information, you have no new statistical information. Okay, um, so what I have annotated here. Uh, how one chooses the force field? What is the guideline to choose one? <laughs> this is a, a, a very complicated question because the, this is the key ingredient of the simulation. So first of all, uh, you should know the set of, of molecules that were used in the parametrization of the force field because one force field means that you have equation and set of parameters, okay? Proposal for several molecules. You need to see your system, see related molecules, if these molecules are in the database of the parametrization, okay? Mm -hmm. Meaning, for example, if I'm going to study phospholipid, there are several force fields specific for, for, for lipids. If you wanted to study proteins, there are several uh, force fields for amino acids, several for sugar, several. The problem is when you wanted to put together force fields that, that are made independently, because sometimes they have different equations, they have different uh, rules of parametrization that make the combination not possible. So most of the trouble that we have is when you have the molecule that does not look like to any other user in the set parameters. Mm -hmm. So then what we do in our group is to perform a initial quantum mechanical calculations to try to parameterize the system in the same philosophy of the force field that we are going to use. But this is the, the, the most difficult part of the simulation, how to select the parameters. Okay. Uh, the quantum mechanical part, is it implemented with a uh, DFT? Uh, Sorry? Is it using density functional theory? In the parametrization? Yeah. Oh, most of the time, yes. Okay. Um, and the polarization, I, I saw you post... Uh, use, mm, you have pictures of your medium. Uh, you always use explicit uh, mediums, such as water having uh, these molecules in the simulation, or there are times in which you use it implicitly. See, here I'm comparing. I didn't talk in the, in the middle of the talk. The, re the line is with continuum model. Mm -hmm. And the, the stars are the explicit. Okay. So for a system that has very polarity, like cyclohexane or a dichloromethane or acetonitrile, they are very good agreement. So if your solvent or your environment has no ability to perform hydrogen bonds, a continuum model can be a very good choice to polarization. Mm -hmm. But in the case of water and other kind of molecules that it has, hydrogen bond, you can see that the black line here is far from what explicit molecules give you. Okay, so my suggestion is if your environment does not going to form hydrogen bond with your molecule, you can use continuum model for polarization. Otherwise, better use explicit. Okay. And I have one last question. Uh, in that benzophonin, uh, phenom phenom that, yes. uh, okay, that molecule, uh, slide, yeah, uh, this graph uh, right below on the right side, uh, you show, uh, is it, could it be the graph showing a preferential attachment position of uh, a given molecule to another? Or not? Uh, uh, that was was what I understood when you first explained it. Uh, 
uh, what we have is uh, that when you have the parameters that you set for your simulation, you are putting information about the interaction. So then all the molecules, they are going to fill this field and be placed in a specific position. Once you change that, the specific positions are going to change also. That's why you needed to have this kind of procedure to make your parameters uh, interact with the positions and then these positions show you where you need to change and make it again. So this out-consistent field make you this, uh, make another distribution of the solvent surrounding your molecule. Mm -hmm. But knowing that before starting is very difficult because there are several parameters that you cannot control. But you are going telling the molecule places where you put more negative charges, we will attract more positive charges from the solvent. So mm -hmm. then when you change the charges, you are changing this distribution. Okay, thank you. Uh, other questions? I, I have one question. Uh, at some point you mentioned that the polarization is a much faster time scale than yes. rotation, right? Yes. But that's very expected because polarization yes. is electron movement and yes. rotations are, yeah? Yes, sure, this is expected. But mm -hmm. the point is, if you put a molecule in one specific environment and it's fastly adapt the charge distribution for, this, for that specific environment, how you know where put the molecule? Because you hope in the simulation that you are going to start with a configuration by random and you are going to reach the equilibrium. But if the equilibrium depends on the charge and the charge is almost instantaneously adapted to the place that you put the molecule, so <laughs> you have a very difficult situation because if you start in the middle, we will adapt in the middle, stay in the middle. If you are out outside, it's we will adapt in the outside, stay in the outside. So this is a kind of system that we can tell that is not ergodic. Where you put it, there are some a lot of forbidden places that we will never visit. Depends on initial condition. Yes. And then this is the most terrible situation for a person that is going to simulate having a system that is strongly depending on the initial position. Mm -hmm. And then how to know if you sample enough initial position to understand each one has the, the smaller free energy. Mm -hmm. And free energy is very difficult to calculate in this kind because we calculate interactions. Interactions is one thing. When we start to think about the entropy, the things start to be much complicated. Oh, okay. Uh, so uh, let's thank Professor Kalin again, please. Thank you. Uh, now we have a very short break just to arrange some stuff here, and then we start the closing ceremony, okay?